Okay, what's up? Uh, this is our first, well, second try at this video, so bear with us. Two times, yeah. That's how much we love you, man, coffee. All right, so we're here to talk to you guys about uh, a warrant officer program for the Army. Joining the Army is kind of a, a big deal, and there's a, kind of a life hack that not a whole lot of people talk about, and it's called the Warrant Officer Flight Training Program. Okay, there's two different ways to do this. You have prior service guys. Hi, that's me. I did six years in the Navy. Now I'm here in the Army waiting class F for Warrant Officer Candidate School. And then you have Street to Seat or what, High School to Flight School. Yeah, the civilian. The things. Yeah. Literally come right out the street and you get your uh, contract to go ahead and go to Warrant Officer School and then go straight to Flight School. So um, a lot of people don't know that's a thing. A lot of people think that it's gone, that it's no longer a thing. But uh, we're going to go ahead and talk to you about the two different ways to do it, whether you're active or changing branches or if you're actually coming off the street. Yeah. So, and the other thing is, is like, we're the, the, the keynote we're gonna hit on real quick is, to, to start is, don't let your recruiter tell you otherwise, okay? Because like you said, a lot of people say it doesn't exist. For the you got prior service guys, it's called Blue to Green. Um, we're gonna hit on a lot of the points, because right now on YouTube, there's really nothing out there that truly describes how to do it. But Blue to Green doesn't exist anymore, so if they tell you that, it's true. However, that's because they named it WAFT. W-O-F-T, just like I said, one officer flight training. So, we're gonna go straight into it. Um, so basic qualifications. Right. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna do is the ASVAB, okay? You need a GT score of a 110 or better, 110 or higher, okay? That is not your QT score, so if they tell you you got a 76 AFQT score, um, great. Ask for your GT score, that's your general technician. What are they, it's like. So it's uh, four categories that break up into your GT score. It's gonna be your arithmetic, your uh, mathematic knowledge, your mm -hmm. word comprehension, and just your basic English section. So those four parts of the ASVAB, I think there's nine total, um, those four of the nine sections make up your GT score, which also qualifies you or disqualifies you from um, this program. Like you said, it's a 110 or greater, just to, just to even apply for this, even to get the ball rolling. The issue is, is when you go and you see a recruiter, they're gonna try to tell you that A, you need a college degree, B, you need a private pilot's license, or C, that you have to go in and you have to do five years as a crew member or as a crew chief or, or something like that before you can apply for this program. Um, so first, first things first, you gotta find the right person. You gotta find the right recruiter. Someone that's gonna work for you and go after what you want because they're there to get numbers. Don't forget that. So when you go and you sit down with them, we're gonna tell you the right questions to ask or the, at least the knowledge to get yourself backed up on. So when you go in there, you, you don't sound like some kid off the street who just heard about this through the grapevine. You actually have some solid facts on um, what, it, what program and how to go about it. And the ASVAB is some key note there. You can take the test as many times as you want, okay? They're gonna tell you yeah, there's waiting times between taking the test and retaking and so on and so forth. Uh, go get ASVAB for Dummies. It's actually a great book. Yeah, I did. Okay, and, and study that. Go in there, knock it out your first try, make this process as short as possible because I, right. I took me six months, it took you. It took me a year. Okay. So the issue is, is if, um, and now it's not like this happened, but if you go in there and you know you you'd bomb out on the ASVAB, they're done taking you serious at that point. They're gonna be like, hey, listen, you're, you're not qualified, so how about we send you this route? And you know you could end up wasting five or six years trying to get to somewhere you could have got if you just took taking this test a little serious. So like you said, go out to what Barnes and Noble. Am, am, yeah. I bought mine on Amazon. Yeah. Go out and get it's your on Amazon. yeah, get your ASVAB for dummies. I, I know it still sounds ridiculous, it, but it'll pay off. Insulting you. Trust me, it'll okay, pay off. I took it. So, all right. So that's going to set you up to even come in and walk through the door. Um, for your prior service guys, you already have an ASVAB score. If you don't have the required DT score, now granted. For the Navy and the Army, they look at two different, completely different categories to make up your GT score. So for the Navy, I had a 120. For the Army, it was 121. A little bit better for the Army, and it's not that much of a difference, but it may in your case. So get your, it's called a RED report, an R-E-D-D -D report. Any senior recruiter or career recruiter know what that is. Have them print it off and check your Army GT score, not your Navy one, okay? Um, some other qualifications. I know this is kind of um, kind of standalone. But uh, you gotta have a high school diploma. You gotta be at least 18 years of age. Yep. You also have to um, be in pretty good health, and we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, eyes and ears and all that good stuff. But moving right along, uh, make sure you have your high school transcript. Um, keep in mind this is a competitive program. If you are going street to seat like myself, you're gonna you're gonna go compete against every other high school or college degree, master's degree, um, everybody else who's interested in this program. You're going to compete against for the selected spot. Um, I don't know. Is it different for the? Uh, okay, so they, there's there's different numbers for both categories. Okay, so they're allotting a specific amount of slots to each of the active duty. Um, if you're active duty army, you got a bit of better shot. Um, 
but they, they, they dole out a specific percentages. I don't know the exact percentages, they change it all the time, but so there's a specific amount of percentages of the pilot slots that go to civilian street seat guys and for active duty. They do that to make it fair, um, and that way you're not, you don't have a, a, a sergeant going up against a guy with a master's degree in aeronautical engineering just because he thought it'd be fun to go fly military helicopters all of a sudden, okay? They do have them, it's not a lot of them, but those two don't, don't compete and they have two completely different life experiences, so. Uh, moving on to qualifications though. So once you have that, then you're gonna go take the SIF test. Selection instrument for flight training. It's um, equivalent to the AFAST. The Army used to use the AFAST, AFAST, correct? But the issue with the AFAST is there was so much information out on the internet that you could pretty much download the test and go into it and just smoke it. So what the Army did is they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to see if these guys have the aptitude. We know they can go out and research things. We've got to make sure they have the aptitude to actually do this MOS, to go actually fly. So what they did is they designed this brand new test. It's, the Army's the only one that uses this. I think the Navy still uses the AFAST, right? They use the Air a Force, a ACE something. Or ASTB. Or Anyways, something. Um, there's not a lot of information on the SIFT. They have study books. Um, believe it or not, the study book that I bought was incorrect. The math problems were wrong. Like, you check the answers. And so don't do any of that. You might just shoot yourself in the foot. The same book. Yeah, I had actually went to Mathnasium and they said that was wrong. <laughs> so the issue, the issue is here, is um, there's going to be a couple things that they don't want you to study for. They want to see if you actually have the aptitude to go out and do this. Um, one of the one of the sections is what was it the differentiating between? Oh, the the special figures. So basically, right. it was it's it's special figures. There's a hundred of them. You got two minutes to do it. Now, don't freak out because they have. It's like four options, and you'll have like lowercase d, lowercase d, right. capital D, lowercase d. One which that's one's, different. Which one's different? Move on, and they want to see speed and accuracy. So, those are a lot of things that we we could get into. We could do, we'll do a whole other video on how to study for the uh, SIFT. But the thing is, is go out and study for this test because the big thing about this test is, if you fail once, now it's out. Of, it's from twenty to eighty. So you, the lowest you can do is a twenty. And twenty is if you write your name on the front of the test and, incorrect, and it, and it sounds like your name. They give you 20 points, okay? 80 is you, you, you're, you're Lance Armstrong. You maxed it, or exactly, Armstrong, you maxed Neil it. Neil Armstrong, sorry, no, I sound like an idiot. So right, anyway, like, yeah, right? but, so, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're gonna go walk on the moon one day. So, the mean score on this thing is a 50. You need a 40 to pass. Now, here's the catch, okay? So, if you do half this test and things don't seem like they're going your way, and you just kinda try to see it out, Christmas tree it, and you get one more try if you fail. Only if you fail. And it's 180 days after, correct? Yeah, you have, you have to, to wait. wait 180 days, so that okay. backs your process out, you know, substantially. You're making this way longer than it has to be, okay? So, if you fail, you get one more shot at it. So, yes, you get a little familiarization with it, but I actually watched the guy that I was testing with. I asked him after the test what happened, because he looked really irritated after he took the test. He said it wasn't going the way he wanted to, so he tried to just Christmas tree it out. Guy scored a 41, okay? That means he's stuck with that. If you get a passing score on the SIFT, you are stuck with that, that that score for life. It is entered into your WAF packet, so when you go to be competitive against guys who scored a 60 or 70 or whatever it may be, you're stuck with that 41 for the life of your WAF packet. You can never go back and retake the okay. SIFT. So take it as serious as possible, do as much research as possible. We're just like we said, letting you know that the SIFT is the next test. And that's your money. That's your that's money. Your, that's your money maker your money for, maker. I mean, other than that, the letters of recommendation, which we'll get to here in a second, but the SIFT is your money as far as applying for this thing. So. Take it seriously, take the time, study for it. Uh, the education center's on base, or I mean, if you're street to seat, you go take it at MEPS. If you're active duty, you are not allowed to take it at MEPS. You have to go to a education center on an army base somewhere, and they will give you the test. So let me give you my experience with the SIFT. Um, it sucked, so um, I don't know if you've been to MEPS yet, if you've even started the process, but with MEPS, is you're, you're up really late the night before, and they get you up at the crack of dawn the day of. So you're already going into the, the test at MEPS at a disadvantage because you're tired, you're uncomfortable, you're in a place that you're not used to. It's Anyways, what they do is they put you in a room and they assign you a proctor. Now this guy literally watched me That's like that the entire test. It took me like two and a half hours and this dude was just... He's breathing my ear. So, I mean, they're making sure you're not cheating, they're doing all that, but what I'm saying is they already have this set up to be harder than it needs to be. So you have to go into it even more so prepared. Um, just to piggyback on that, this process itself is designed to... This process itself is designed to be so drawn out and so, that's what I'm looking for. It's intimidating. Exactly, so you have to go into it knowing that this is something that you wanna see through because they've made it to where it's. It's labor intensive. Exactly. So the, the, 
the fact that the application process is so long is actually your first test. Okay, they want to see that you have the, the, the fortitude and the foresight see your way to through. see your way through the whole thing, complete the packet. If you complete the packet, you already had like 60% of the people who start this process. Okay, there's a lot it, of people out there you that get talk sick of about it. it. It's, it's no joke, it's a process, especially so, for you street to seat guys, because you got to prove it. You got to prove that you, you can come off the street and do what it takes most army officers five, six years to get themselves locked into.